This week on Worldview, we turn to Pakistan as Nawaz Sharif returns and elections are announced for February. Is India's neighbor readying for a new chapter in democracy? Or is it just more of the same with the military in charge, no matter who comes to power? We're going to speak up ahead to author and scholar Dr. Aisha Siddiqua. Hello and welcome to Worldview at the Hindu with me, Sohasini Heather. Now this week, after months of some dire predictions about whether they would be held at all, uh, Pakistan's president, uh, Arif Alvi, announced the general elections would be held in the country on February the 8th. The announcement came after the Supreme Court that has been hearing petitions against the delay pushed the election commission for a date. The previous Shabazz Sharif government, remember, had handed over to a caretaker government, which is the, uh, which is the policy in Pakistan, and it had handed over on August 9th. Elections were due to be held within 90 days of that, or three months. The Pakistani Election Commission has been saying the delay has been caused by the need for delimitation of constituencies in line with Pakistan's latest census. The other big development in the past few weeks, and you must have seen pictures of this, was the return of former Pakistan Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, three times in fact he's been Prime Minister, for the first time since he left the country in a sort of self-imposed exile. He'd gone to London after he was dismissed as Prime Minister in 2017, disqualified from standing for office over the Panama Papers case involving undeclared assets and he'd been arrested as well and then was out on bail. On his return, an emotional meeting with his daughter Maryam Sharif, who's certainly been being groomed as his successor, and a massive public rally at the Minare Pakistan, where he spoke, amongst other things, about good ties with India. Listen in. हम अपना हम सायों के साथ लड़ाई करके दुनिया के साथ अच्छा तालुक करके तरक्की नहीं कर सकते। हमें सब के साथ अच्छे तालुकात कायम करना होगे। और कश्मीर के हल के लिए भी बहुत बावकार तत्वीर के साथ आगे बढ़ना होगा, बड़े बावकार तरीके से आगे बढ़ना होगा, तत्वीर के साथ बढ़ना होगा। Now Nawaz Sharif is still disqualified. It's unclear whether he'll be able to even stand in the upcoming elections. He does plan to appeal for a review of his sentencing, or is he just going to remain the power behind the throne? if the PMLN, his party, wins at the center or state levels. Now, the other big party in the outgoing government's ruling coalition, so they were in power till now, the PPP chief, former uh, Pakistan president Asif Ali Zardari. Now, actually, the, pres the president of the party, the chief of the party is his son, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, but for all practical purposes, it is Asif Ali Zardari uh, who does rule the party. He's been summoned now in another corruption case on December the 18th. And he also announced this week uh, about his political ambitions. He said he won't allow Nawaz Sharif, for example, to become prime minister and that the PPP will form the government in February. So some uh, uh, uncertainty there. And finally, there's the third party in Pakistan, the PTI, the pa Pakistan Tehreek-e Insaf, whose leader, former Prime Minister Imran Khan, still remains in jail. Uh, he's received bail in a number of cases, but he remains in high security prison over the Cypher case saga, which we had spoken about, remember, in Worldview episode 118. You can go back and watch that or read about it. Uh, he gets in touch with his uh, with his supporters, his family, through his family who comes to visit him in that prison, uh, puts out messages over social media. But there seems little chance at present that he's going to be allowed to campaign during the election, let alone uh, standing for elections as well. He's been disqualified thus far. So all those leaders, and, and that's the state really of each of the top political parties in Pakistan. And when asked about the state of Pakistan's polity, it's unabashedly pro-army caretaker Prime Minister Anwar Kakar had this to say. He spoke this week at a premier management school in Pakistan. We are not a subtle democracy. Uh, there was a democracy in the Europe. Uh, it has uh, taken its own shape where it morphed from dictatorship to, to civilian supremacy and it took them a few centuries. It, is, it, it was not that easy uh, journey. We want to have it a bit easy way, just having few conversations here in the halls 
and get all those subtle questions which is related to political power, economic power and social power. Quite an understatement that it's not a settled democracy. Let's just get you some historical perspective on Pakistan's democracy. For about the last six, uh, half of the last six decades, 33 years in all, Pakistan has been under the direct rule of the military from 58 to 71, from 77 to 1988 and then 1999 to 2008. So military ruler has been the president or there's been martial law. For the rest of the years, the governments have been dismissed at will by the military and one prime minister, former Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was even hanged by the military ruler at the time, General Ziaul Haq. No Pakistani government has actually completed a full five-year term since the creation of Pakistan 75 years ago, without exception. In the past 15 years, since the last military ruler, Musharraf, uh, the army has played a more behind-the-scenes role, if you like. But it does pull the rug out from under the feet of Asif Ali Zardari, Nawaz Sharif, Imran Khan by turn, if they seem to be either not obeying or not respecting uh, the military's control of events. And this is not unlike the role that the military played between 88 and 99, for example, uh, turning, uh, turfing out Nawaz Sharif, Benazir Bhutto by turns until General Musharraf took over. This one in 2024 will be the first election where, as of now, the leaders of all three parties, uh, three-time Prime Minister Sharif, Benazir Bhutto's husband and former President Asif Ali Zardari, as well as former Prime Minister Imran Khan, will not actually be contesting themselves and will play the role of the power behind the throne within their parties. Meanwhile, the military has grown in strength, power, influence, what is called milibus, military business. Uh, without the accountability cases that political leaders face, uh, there are estimates that it controls about 50% of Pakistan's economy and certainly a sizable part of the land as well. Earlier, I spoke to someone who really talks about this and writes about this, Aisha Siddiqa. She's the author of Military Inc., a book about the Pakistani military. It now has a revised edition as well. And I began by asking her what she made of the announcement of the elections. If I could just start with the news that's happened right now, which is the final announcement. And uh, uh, now there's a notification as well from the president that elections will be held in Pakistan on February the 8th. Uh, given some of the dire predictions we had heard over the year about how elections have been postponed indefinitely now, uh, what do you make of the announcement? Well, it, I mean, it, it can't be kind of wished away. And one of the reasons that we will have elections is that now Nawaz Sharif is back in Pakistan, for one. And two, if you don't hold elections now, there's going to be a lot more discomfort and a lot of fingers pointed at the army. Uh, and I'm sure they don't want to take the burden either. So the idea is hold elections, give responsibility to whoever is the favorite and move on. All right. So now that the announcement has been made, uh, many would say, what kind of election is this really going to be? The uh, the person who seems to be the most popular leader in Pakistan, at least judging by some of the crowds we've seen, uh, remains the former prime minister and the PTI chief Imran Khan. Uh, is this election going to be seen as uh, basically free and fair? Well, I don't think I mean, one which is which is for sure is that elections are not going to be free and fair. Uh, the caretaker prime minister in Bar uh yesterday he gave an interview to Neador. His argument was all parties will be allowed to contest elections. Uh, I don't think that's a problem, uh, but we know where the problem lies. The problem is that there is no PTI without him, uh, and he's disqualified. The other thing is, who's going to contest? Because even Nawaz Sharif uh, is still disqualified. And that is a problem which needs to be sorted out. Um, so you have two big leaders, Imran Khan and Nawaz Sharif, both popular in their own ways. Both are disqualified at the moment. Uh, so what kind of elections? I mean, one is not exactly hopeful. I mean, I've, 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 I mean, despite that I sit in London, of course, I'm very connected. So I keep following people, and one of the things that I keep hearing is that, so what's going to happen now? Who are you going to vote for? And they're like, look, if we have this impression or if we have the feeling that it's not going to be fair, 
we're not going to go on with it. So I'm assuming there's going to be a low turnout uh, in these elections if people are not hopeful. Uh, it has to be really magical if, if, if it's going to be a huge turnout. Uh, definitely the, the signals one is getting is that PMLN remains the favorite. If not Nawaz Sharif, definitely the PMLN. Um, PPP will survive in Sindh. And uh, so there's going to be elections back to elections, but these are elections in which people are not going to have a lot of faith. Right. Now, we also saw as Nawaz Sharif came back to Pakistan um, that he did uh, address a very big rally. Uh, and many are saying that while you are looking at two incumbents who were in uh, coalition, the PPP and the PMLN, who are essentially uh, not as popular as uh, the opposition that now um, uh, whose leader is behind bars, Imran Khan, the real point is it doesn't matter who does get elected. Uh, because no political uh, government in Pakistan has completed a five-year term so far since Pakistan's uh, creation. Um, and, and that is always a crude to the role of the army. Now, you've written about this very often. Uh, the question really is, Pakistan, uh, are there any signs that there could be a change in that role of the army in who will, uh, uh, will rule, or is it just going to be more of the same? So, Hasni, my question to you is, do you see anyone challenging that military role? No. You know, Benazir Bhutto, way back, signed the NRO with the Army General, came back. Nawaz Sharif has come back with, uh, you know, with his, with his, uh, with an agreement with, uh, with the Army Chief. Correct. Before that, it was. Ram Khan was again, uh, you know, in conversation with the, and he came with agreement of, of, of the, of the army chief then. So nothing is changing. And, 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 the, and the problem is that none of these guys are trying to, you know, carry out institutional reforms to, uh, you know, harness the military. Where are the institutional reforms? Where is putting faith into where, where is reclaiming the Ministry of Defense, which Bhutto in 1974, his higher defense reorganization, uh, you know, he had um, restructured it, uh, you know, the control of the, the management of the military. Nobody is thinking, I mean, it's all personal. This general supports me, that general supports me, and that kind of an arrangement. And I think, I'm these guys, nobody is strengthening the parliament, no party is strengthening the parliament or building its capacity to uh, you know, to fight to, to, to push back the military so I don't see uh, things turning around all right, and 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 given that um, that that pattern has remained, uh, leader after leader has uh, turned against the army, uh, been turfed out returned with the blessing of the army. Uh, but since 2008 uh, and, and since uh, General per Parvez Musharraf left, the army has not taken control or taken charge as it used to so often in Pakistan's history. Uh, do you see, given the economic strain on Pakistan, the you know, defaults that we're looking at, the IMF troubles, uh, the, the, the rupees uh, own stability, um, uh, do you see the army wanting to take a greater role uh, in fronting the government? It already has. I mean, the military in Pakistan already has a greater role. I mean, look, I my own assessment is that 2000 is a major decision was taken, which was the military was going to shift from control of government to control of governance. You know, where is this whole concept of hybridity comes from? So what they did really was is that they would not take control of government, not come, uh, you know, not have a martial law, but they'll be running everything else. I mean, look at what's happening now. I mean, National Accountability Bureau, which is the prime anti-corruption organization, that's now run by a general, retired general. Uh, it's manned by more military officers. NADRA, which is the National Database and Registration Authority, very critical, even critical for elections. 
that now is infested with the military officers. Uh, so every organization from PIA to uh, military now has a role in in investment, bringing investment in the country. So economic role. So what are we talking about? Uh, so you know, this is this is the army really uh, with a bigger role, and this hybridity which was introduced in two thousand eight is going to continue. That's a very convenient thing. See what it means is that the military will not be directly responsible for everything. The face will be civilian, but these civilians will take responsibility for decisions which are taken by the military. So nothing changes. Um, so an important distinction you're making there, Aisha, between the uh, army fronting the control of government to the control of governance uh, per se. Uh, and so my final question is really about India. We have heard generals in the past, from General Musharraf to General Bajwa, uh, talking about the importance of ties with India, geoeconomics over geopolitics. Um, we haven't seen an improvement in ties with India. Uh, certainly, uh, but we did hear Nawaz Sharif in his first speech again talk about trying to make ties better with India. What is your read? Has the mood in Pakistan come any closer uh, to better ties with India now? I think the mood was always good. Uh, generals coming from General Kiani to General Bajwa to General, uh, well, actually, General Musharraf to General Kiani to General. Bajwa to now uh, General Asimuni, they all want to improve relations, but they don't want to take a hurried leap. And I think the, the mistake which I believe uh, Mia Nawaz Sharif made, uh, you know, in his in his third year was, you know, invite, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi, in, Prime Minister Modi came, came to Lahore, visited, and the, and, the, and the feeling was that it was two Prime Ministers who were directly going to, uh, you know, build direct ties and with the keeping Pakistan military out. This is not something which it wants to happen. So I think military is not going to block uh, going forward with India. But it has to be slow and yeah, gradual. Yeah. And yeah, uh, some kind of talks have to uh, happen. The, the, the I don't part, think that uh, the Bash Sharif would be allowed to kind of, uh, you know, kind of, you know, run through, through it. Dr. Aisha Siddiqua there. She's also a senior fellow at King's College in London at present. Now, we have spoken earlier about how events in Pakistan affect Indian foreign policy. I'm not going to go into those now, but think of the combination this year of what we're calling election again year in South Asia that may have a combined greater impact. Maldives has already changed hands in the elections this year. We covered that in Worldview episode 126. Bangladesh is expected to go to vote in January 2024. 20, uh, Bhutan, where the government has handed over to a caretaker government just this week, is also due for elections by February the 1st. Pakistan now has a date set for February the 8th. India itself is expected to hold elections in March and April with a new government expected by the end of May 2024. Uh, and Sri Lanka is due for presidential elections by September 2024, government and IMF willing. So really all except uh, perhaps Afghanistan and Nepal. Uh, we're going to see elections around South Asia. So what's worldviews take? In a turmoil-ridden subcontinent other than Afghanistan, Pakistan has perhaps the most troubled relationship with democracy as it heads into an election period where none of its most popular leaders are eligible to stand. Will it mo vote for more of the same or seek out a new leadership or at least a new generation of the old leadership? given that each of the present leaders have paid the political price for challenging the army it does seem however that the pakistani military's role in governance if not in government itself is cast in stone for the foreseeable future and let's get you some worldview reading recommendations and some of these are repeats 
Uh, but on Pakistan, I can't stress enough that because there's such a, a turnover of events, de rapid developments that somehow seem like a recycling of an old historical cycle as well. Uh, these are all very valid reading recommendations. The first, I spoke about this military ink inside Pakistan's military economy. This was revised, uh, second edition in 2017 by Dr. Aisha Siddiqui. Then other books on the same uh, subjects, uh, The Army and Democracy, Military Politics in Pakistan by Akhil Shah is really worth reading, even though it's about 10 years old. And then Pakistani Military and Politics, Origins, Evolution, Consequences by Ishtiaq Ahmed. These two are lesser known books, academic a little bit, but well worth reading. Then of course the new one, Pakistan Origins, Identity and Future by Parvez Hoodboy, a real must read. Uh, the Pakistan Paradox, Instability and Resilience, Christoph Jafrilo, so he's an international scholar. Uh, another Pakistani scholar, The Struggle for Pakistan, A Muslim Homeland and Global Politics by Aisha Jalal. Really, really well-written book. Uh, and then an author we've had on Worldview before, Hussein Haqqani, two books, recent books, uh, Pakistan Between Mosque and Military and Reimagining Pakistan, Transforming a Dysfunctional Nuclear State. Those are by Professor Hussain Haqqani. Uh, and then by an Indian diplomat based in Pakistan at one time called Pakistan at the Helm by Til Tilak Devashar. I've spoken about some of his other books before. In Pursuit of Peace. India-Pakistan relations under six prime ministers, Satinder Kumar Lamba. This is the definitive book. If you read no other book about the India-Pakistan uh, relationship, please do read this one. And finally, we don't always recommend here on Worldview books that we agree with, but books that we think offer an important perspective. And this is a perspective by a former Pakistani diplomat who was posted in Delhi in some very important years since 2014. Uh, and it's called Hostility, a Diplomat's Diary on Pakistan-India Relations by Abdul Basit. We hope you enjoy reading all of those and do join us again here on Worldview as we keep track of all the big events from the team here. Thanks for watching.